Hello, and welcome to DocWire. My name is Dr. Pio Coley. I'm a cardiologist from Denver, Colorado, and editor of the cardiology section at DocWire. And it's my pleasure today to be joined by Dr. Monica Gandhi. Dr. Gandhi is an infectious disease doctor, a professor of medicine, and a associate chief in the Division of HIV Infectious Diseases and Global Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. Welcome, Dr. Gandhi. Thank you. Uh, we're very excited to have you here today because you've obviously done a lot of impactful work in COVID-19 and mitigation strategies. But I really want today to focus on our discussion about vaccines and yes. how they're going to change the face of the pandemic. So I want to start just by asking you to talk a little bit about the available vaccines that are out there, what's cooking on the horizon, and how you think they're going to impact our fight against this virus. Yes, so um, it's great news that we actually have six phase three trial results now for six different vaccines. And in fact, just this morning, it looks like there's gonna be some data coming out of the vaccine from China. But at this moment, we have four full publications for the Moderna vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, which are both mRNA vaccines. Then we have the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is not um, yet in publication. It's a um, adenovirus DNA vaccine. Then we have Novavax, which is a protein vaccine with an adjuvant, um, also not yet um, just in a press release. And then we have the Sputnik V, which is an adenovirus vaccine, which is in um, a publication form. And then we have the AstraZeneca University of Oxford vaccine, adenovirus DNA. So we have six vaccine phase three trial results. So that is really exciting to have that this early um, after the pandemic. Yeah, and you know, there's obviously advantages and disadvantages of each candidate, availability, but in general, what would your advice be for us to tell our patients when they ask us which vaccine should they get? So um, right now, only Moderna and Pfizer, Pfizer are authorized in the US, but the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, um, it's FDA uh, emergency use authorization uh, date is February 26, and we do expect to hear favorable um, results from that. And if that's true, there will truly in a way be a choice or I don't know if there's a choice, but there'll be a discussion to be had with patients because right now Moderna and Pfizer are pretty much the same thing. mRNA vaccines work great, 95% efficacy, 100% against severe disease. The Pfizer and Pfizer, uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is different. It's an adenovirus. Um, it has DNA in it. It's kind of more traditional of a vaccine. And it was really effective. Again, it prevented hospitalizations at 100%. Um, we have a table here that shows this. But its um, efficacy against mild disease was a little less than um, the mRNA vaccine. So let's focus on severe first. There was a category called severe disease, which um, they didn't define that well because it's in the press release. We really need to see that FDA briefing that they'll put out. But it was 85% effective against severe disease, which included the subset of people who are hospitalized. And um, it was equally as effective for severe disease in the US, in, the, in South Africa, in Latin America, and the South Africa site, they actually sequenced the virus and said 95% of the circulating virus was the B1351, the South Africa variant. So really great efficacy, same efficacy, even against that variant for severe disease. It was mild disease where the Johnson & Johnson differed. It prevented mild disease at 72% in the US and 57% in South Africa. This could be that um, T cells help us mediate uh, responses to severe disease and the T cells are great, but maybe our antibodies are not as robust against the South Africa variant with Johnson & Johnson. Given that we don't need to be perfect, given that this is really effective in the US, given that severe disease is averted at that high rate, and given we don't have great vaccine rollout yet because of the Moderna and Pfizer, we don't have the supplies, I would favor, and I hope the FDA will approve it, uh, authorize it, and I do think that patients should feel comfort comfortable that they're getting the percent efficacy that we were dreaming of in the summer. We used to say, oh, 60%, that would be amazing. <laughs> so we got spoiled a little with the 95% uh, with, with the mRNAs. You know, all great points. And it also raises, obviously, the issue of the one dose vaccine versus requiring yes. two doses and which one is going to get us to our target faster. So I'm curious which side of the coin you fall on. Some health experts have said it makes more sense, even with the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine, to get those first doses out 
delay those second doses and just try to get as many people getting the first dose. Others have said the opposite, like Dr. Fauci, which is that we really need to stick with the timeline. So what are your thoughts on, on which of those we should be employing as a country? Yes, I, I do have an opinion on that. I will say you're right, absolutely, the Johnson & Johnson, you're so right to say one dose, how great, like that will make it easier. But um, in terms of the one dose uh, versus delaying and delaying the second dose versus um, doing the sec two doses on schedule for the mRNA vaccines, I fall on the side of one dose to everyone now and delaying the second dose. So um, in no way, it, I don't think anyone's ever written, except for maybe people who've had COVID before, which is a whole other data set, that anyone should not get the second dose. So the second dose has to be given. But there's um, lots of reasons in my mind why we could delay the second dose to get to herd immunity faster, to get people partially vaccinated faster. One is that the AstraZeneca trial showed, which is a different vaccine, showed that the longer you wait between doses, the better. Actually waiting 12 weeks was better than nine weeks, was better than six weeks. So, and then the second, so that, that was helpful information that delaying is okay. Second, is that actually, when we think about childhood vaccinations, we don't care if a child comes in too late. We care if a child comes in too soon. And um, it's, it's we, if they come in too soon, we won't give the second dose, but uh, a child that comes in late, you don't restart the vaccine series, you just give the vaccine because there's this principle in vaccinology that waiting between doses is not gonna hurt anything. And third, um, and in fact, it could be more efficacious. And third, the phase one, phase two data of the mRNA vaccine showed immunogenicity was increasing after the first dose. The reason they did three to four weeks for the second dose is because they were in a hurry for these trials. So I see no problem delaying the second dose and I do differ from others on that. And I don't think it's like antibiotics. I don't think you're gonna break through with um, mutant virus. Those are all great points. Now you mentioned herd immunity. We talk about this virus having a herd immunity threshold of about 70%. You know, when do you think we'll get to that uh, currently based on how the rollout is going and, and how do you think our lives will be once we get there? Do you think we'll be wearing these masks forever? Do you think there'll be some semblance of normalcy in our lives after we cross, cross that threshold? Yes, I actually um, um, of, of very much of the ilk that we will get back to normal. We will not mask and distance. And in fact, I think that human, if anything has revealed how loneliness and mental health and how important it is for primates like humans to be together, it has been this pandemic. So I would um, really encourage uh, policymakers to think about the impact of loneliness during this pandemic. But um, so herd immunity, I do believe it's going to be 70%. And like you say, it all depends on the vaccine rollout progress. The way we're going now, we're not going to get there, I think, unless we get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine or unless there's some magical up, up tick in the Moderna and Pfizer, which, which they are saying they'll get more of the doses in March. But the reason I say that is um, California has been given best estimates of a million doses a week. That's best estimates. That would be 40 uh, weeks to get to 40 million people. Um, and so if it was, if we have the Johnson & Johnson, I think we could get there by fall. And if we don't get the Johnson & Johnson, um, which I hope we do, I think we're not gonna get there till winter of 2021. And it will be obvious when we get to herd immunity, it's not like people are gonna be counting like the number of people and say, this is the tick mark of 70%. What will be obvious is that hospitalizations will decrease massively like they are with rollout programs, uh, real world rollout programs in Israel. Um, they will decrease massively and we will see it. Second is that people will be swabbing for cases because they do swab, uh, we test very frequently and those cases will be coming down and you just, it will be, it will reveal itself almost so that it, it simply won't be the health problem of the day. And uh, I think it will, that's the magical thing about herd immunity, the virus can't find anyone to infect. So I'm very hopeful for fall if we can get the Johnson & Johnson. You know, we've already vaccinated uh, a lot of healthcare workers, obviously nursing home residents. There was some debate about whether we were starting in the right population, because this is not the population that's most likely to be spreading the virus. It's more the younger individuals. But we've, we've received some data that the vaccinations thus far have already started to make an impact on hospital morbidity and mortality. So what are your thoughts on that? Do you think we've already started to make a dent in, in the impact from this pandemic with the vaccines we've administered thus far? 
That's a great question because the CDC on Sunday estimated we reached 32 million Americans, which is 10% of the population. There is also an estimate from the same body that maybe 30 million people or more, maybe even more. I mean, there have been, Dr. Ofed has gone up to a third of the US population has been already infected with COVID. Um, unclear what exactly where we stand. What is that exact number? We won't know because we haven't done uh, massive serology studies, but between our natural immunity and the vaccine rollout, and of course, likely all the restrictions which are still ongoing, there's no doubt our hospitalization rates are down, which is great news. We should be celebrating this uh, massively. And yes, I kind of think the vaccinations are contributing because North Dakota and West Virginia are the two places where they've had the best rollout uniquely. I mean, I don't, I, you know, New York, um, California has been unfortunately behind and uh, they are seeing like, like no deaths, you know, over days, for example, from COVID-19. So it's really reassuring to see the vaccines do what they're supposed to do. And, you know, uh, now that we know the vaccines offer partial protection, at least against the new variants, uh, we did get some disturbing news out of South Africa, obviously, about the AstraZeneca vaccine, not, you know, reducing mild to moderate illness and the South African variant. But I'm curious, what sort of precautions do you think we ought to continue to exercise even after we're vaccinated as healthcare workers? Are you double masking? Are you continuing to socially distance? What advice would you give your colleagues and, and your friends? So I think that, um, I do think the CDC is gonna update their advice on this based on something Dr. Fauci intimated in a press conference. But um, I think two vac vaccinated people can be together without restriction. And um, I think we've been messaging so far, nothing changes after vaccination. I think mm -hmm. that is actually pretty discouraging to people because like, what is the point? We know these vaccines will get us out of it. So um, I'm all for tiered nuanced messaging because I'm an HIV doctor at heart. So I don't say to my uh, patients who don't have HIV, this is what you have to do, even if your partner is positive or negative. It's like very nuanced, it's like two positive people is my recommendation. Two people who, one person who doesn't have HIV, one person who does have HIV, this is my recommendation. So it's called tiered messaging. So I would um, recommend that vaccinated people um, do not maintain uh, these restrictions of masking and distancing. This has implications for people in a hospital setting, healthcare workers going back to in-person meetings um, because I think teaching uh, rounds, clinical care, there's a lot that's been affected in our own system by um, the restrictions. And then any, theoretically, and I, I do believe that we should still message this, a vaccinated person in, out in society because we don't have mass vaccination yet has to behave as if uh, they're protecting others, so they have to mask and distance so that they go to the store mask and distance because there's no um, letter that says if you're vaccinated or not. And then the third is um, a, a vaccinated person against an unvaccinated person one-on-one -on -one should protect that unvaccinated person by masking and distancing one-on-one, -on -one, like a doctor with a patient. Now, you know, do I think that these vaccines are going to decrease um, asymptomatic infection? I do but this is the most prudent recommendation at the time. You know, I really like that tiered approach because I think you're right. One of the ways that we're going to get mass vaccination out there is, is to really motivate people that it is gonna allow us to get our lives back to normal. But the message has just been everybody stay, keeps doing the same thing because some of those subtleties sometimes get lost on people. We did get some encouraging data about the Pfizer vaccine today that maybe it does reduce transmission as well. Of course, we've seen that both with Moderna and with, with the AstraZeneca vaccine, asymptomatic infection is reduced as well. So I think you're absolutely right that once you know all of us are vaccinated, our lives will get back to normal. But yes. in the meantime, for those of us that are vaccinated, we can perhaps start to think about relaxing some of those restrictions, which I think would be welcome change for all of us. Yes, so my last and good for, for mental you, health. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right substance use yes, and you know yes. all the other things that have have really been a uh, collateral damage from this yes, pandemic so far definitely. you know yes so my last question for you dr gandhi is you know what what do you really think about how the covid19 vaccine rollout has been going what would you do differently and you did allude to some states that had done it right. Do you think there ought to be some sort of federally guided COVID-19 rollout? We've still got several months ahead of us getting this vaccine out. What would your advice be if you were sitting on President Biden's task force? 
Yes, my advice would be very specific around that, actually. Um, I really liked, um, you know, when the ACIP put out their guidelines in December about tiered rollout because it just totally made sense to me. First, like healthcare workers and long-term care facilities, then older people, then essential workers and different tiers. It actually ended up being a barrier because <laughs> keeping a strict adherence to tiers, which um, California has done, for example, has uh, meant, and I'm, I'm in a hospital on the ground trying to volunteer for vaccination shifts and they don't need me because um, it's right now only above 65. And um, at our hospital, we serve a vulnerable patient population. They don't all have um, phones. We can't find all the 65 year olds. And in the meantime, children can't go back to school because teachers um, are asking to be vaccinated first. So I would first collapse it from the federal government. I would give this advice that says uh, immediately, over 65 and essential workers and I would go so far as to 16 to 64 with medical conditions not because we have all those vaccine supplies but the very the very barriers that we set up means that at the end of the day vaccine goes to vaccines can go to waste um, we can't slot people in if someone doesn't show up for their appointment any logistical barrier you can decrease, which is what West Virginia, North Dakota, Texas, uh, many, many places have done, has actually ended up being doing better. They, it's true they don't have enough supply, but whatever supply they have goes right into people, whereas we're still sitting on supply in California, which is the most um, sticking with the greater than 65. So I'm very concerned about teachers and schools and teachers needing to go back into classrooms. So um, I would at least open it up to essential workers and over 65. You know, I really like that because you're absolutely right. We're actually creating those bottlenecks by having this tiered system. And of yeah. course, the supply is a bottleneck, as is the, is the administration. But those are natural bottlenecks we can deal with. But the tiered system, in some ways, has created certain bottlenecks that I do think that would eliminate. So, yes, well, I wanna, we created I wanna, it. That's yeah. right. <laughs> I want to thank you so much, Dr. Gandhi, for your time this morning, all your wonderful insights and comments. I've, I've learned so much just from listening to you and talking with you. And I hope we can have another discussion very soon in a few weeks about, about the rest of, of the new mutants and the rest of the COVID-19 pandemic fight. So thanks thank again you. for your time Thank you today. so much. Yeah, great to talk to you.